Uh, so welcome everybody to our roundtable discussion on weather, climate, drought, and USDA resources. This roundtable discussion is part of the University of Wyoming Extension Agriculture and Horticulture Online Convention. We hope that you all have been able to successfully access the pre-recorded pre webinars associated with the convention, especially the one that Wendy Kelly um, provided that is a precursor to this event right here. Um, and we also hope you've been able to access the other live Q&A sessions that have been going on. Uh, this roundtable discussion is one of two that are being held as part of the convention. Um, but before I get started, um, before we get started, I should introduce myself. My name is Christy Hansen. I am uh, the University of Wyoming Water Resource Economics Specialist with the University of Wyoming Extension, and I am based in Laramie. Uh, and I'm the moderator for this session. And I would also like to take this opportunity before we really get started to recognize our sponsors for this event and to thank them for their support. Um, you can see uh, that we have a list of sponsors that are rolling um, in the window labeled host. And so our sponsors are the Farm Bureau, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, the USDA Farm Services Agency, the Wyoming Department of Agriculture Mediation Program, the Wyoming Livestock Roundup, Wyoming Stock Growers Association, and the Wyoming Wool Growers Association. Our tech support person is Jenny Thompson. She is labeled host, uh, and so our sponsor's logos are rolling across her background. You won't see Jenny as she works behind the scenes to keep things working smoothly for us, but you may hear her from time to time uh, because she and I will both be monitoring the Q&A window for your questions so that we can get your questions answered um, as smoothly as possible by our panelists. We have a great set of panelists lined up for today's session. So what we'll do here in a minute is introduce each of them and then allow them to um, speak for a minute or two about their areas of expertise and anything they think that, um, that we all need to know about, about their, their expertise. Um, so as our panelists are speaking and introducing themselves. Um, you can go ahead and put any questions you might have for any of our panelists in the, the Q&A window at the bottom of your, your Zoom interface. And it would also be helpful if you could indicate um, if your question is to be directed to a particular panelist. And we will share your questions with the panelists as they come in. Um, so let's go ahead and get started with some introductions. The first panelist that I'm going to introduce is Tony Bergantino. Tony is the Acting Director and program, pro Programmer Analyst at the Water Resources Data System and the State Climate Office here at the University of Wyoming. Tony has worked at the Water Resources Data System and the State Climate Office now for over 25 years. Uh, his interests and work focus on topics of drought, climate networks, water availability, consumptive use, snowpack and runoff, and also the general climate of Wyoming. Tony also serves as the state coordinator for the Community Collaborative Rain, Hail and Snow Network. So Jenny, could you um, share some slides here? Now Tony's gonna um, share with us a bit more information and I believe you have a slide to accompany your, your comments, Tony. Well, thank you, Christy. As Christy mentioned, my name is Tony Bergantino. I'm the Acting Director for the Wyoming Water Resources Data System in the State Climate Office. And I'm also the one of the ones who sends in the recommendations for Wyoming to the US Drought Monitor with input from various entities around the state. Just wanted to briefly give an update and show you a few maps of where things are at around Wyoming here. And start with the, uh, the lower left map there on the screen, which is the current status of the US Drought Monitor. And it's pretty much unchanged since what Wendy showed in her presentation from back around the middle of December or so. And that stands to reason is this time of the year, things generally do not change much as we are looking at frozen precipitation, i.e. snow coming down. So we're not fully sure of what the benefit of the moisture will end up providing once things start to melt. Um, the upper left map there shows the current drought uh, for forecast for lack of a better term. And for much of Wyoming, it's showing that the, the drought that we're currently in is likely to persist for at least the next month, and it will probably be going on longer than that. And part of the reason for this is, is shown in the two maps that I have there on the, on the right. 
these both show the total precipitation received around the state for the last uh, roughly four months. Um, instead of the typical percent of normal that's often uh, associated with precipitation, these are shown in terms of a percentile since the drought monitor is based largely on that, on that condition. And percentile is just a ranking of where the current value falls in terms of all the others observed. So for example, if precipitation is at the 10th percentile, it means that only 10% of the time have we seen precipitation values are less than what is currently, currently being observed. So keeping in mind how dry Wyoming was during the time when we were having the liquid precipitation, that is the rain, when looking at how much we've received in the form of snow since, which is covered in that roughly 100 in that 120 day period, this should give a little bit of an idea when you see the, the red on the map and the low percentiles that we've gotten. And then the, the bottom map there shows the corresponding drought category for those percentiles. You can see why it's expected that this drought is likely to persist into the, at least the short term and possibly the medium term future. Thank you, Tony. That's great. And I'm sure we'll have lots of questions for you about the drought monitor in particular. I know I certainly do. So our next panelist is Aviva Brown. She's the lead meteorologist and incident meteorologist uh, for the National Weather Service in Cheyenne. Uh, she has served the communities of Southeast Wyoming and Western Nebraska Panhandle in this capacity for the past three years. She has a passion for fire weather and for serving the underserved communities within her forecast area. And also as an incident meteorologist, she has been deployed to numerous fires such as the Camp Fire in Northern California and most recently the Williams Fork and Cameron Peak fires in Northern Colorado. Aviva, thank you for joining us today and uh, I look forward to hearing your, your comments right now. Thank you, Christy. Um, like Christy said, my name is Aviva Braun. I am a lead meteorologist at the National Weather Service in Cheyenne. Um, I also serve as what's called an incident meteorologist being sent out, deployed to wildfires around the country. Um, most recently, I was in Colorado. Basically, when I serve in this role, I am forecasting directly for the firefighters and the incident management team on the fire. I'm also helping message out um, potential threats to the local communities. And lastly, I do serve as a co-lead um, for the agriculture out outreach program that we have at our office. Um, I helped initiate it and I help lead it. Um, so I wanted to speak specifically to a few things. I'll just touch on a few bullets here. Um, we are in the midst of a strong La Nina event. I don't want to get too much into this, but that and um, our previous bark beetle infestation led to an active fire weather season in the central Rockies. Um, we had fires here in Wyoming, such as the Mullen fire, um, and then fires um, just south of our border that were quite large. Um, and we always see an up, uh, uptick in large fires during La Nina years, or seems that there is a correlation between the two. Um, we are looking ahead to a potential pre-green window, although um, we're hoping that that green is actually green. Um, there is some concern looking ahead that if we don't quite make up um, precipitation uh, in the spring um, for the next fire weather season. Um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the next month. Um, that's about as far ahead as I can go with forecasting and it's just a general forecast, not a specific forecast. But for now, through the end of January, we do look like we're in a dry and windy pattern. Um, and in terms of fire weather, linking that back to what I was just talking about, we have many season slowers. Um, no season enders. So what you would want for after fire season um, is a really large dumping of precipitation to just put out those fires and we just haven't had that. We've had little uh, wispy things go by and dump a little bit um, and then dry up very quickly with the winds that come behind them. So um, there's nothing that's really ended our fire season and actually I do serve um, for the Western Nebraska Panhandle and they do have fuels that are ready um, for fire. So we are still thinking about red flag warnings in the back of our heads as forecasters. Um, lastly, um, we I do serve as a co-lead 
um, for our agriculture agriculture program. Um, and basically we're trying to widen our reach and speak directly to our producers and our agricultural community members and helping them protect themselves and their property by letting them know what's coming um, in a timely manner. Um, so some things that we have done already, um, we've held interviews with local papers and radio stations, we've published in newsletters such as Cow Country and Conservation District newsletters. We have been to a handful of fairs and conferences, obviously that was kind of put on hold due to COVID. Um, and we send out situation reports. I've been doing them pretty, um, pretty regularly um, every month or so uh, while we're in drought. So. Um, do reach out to me if you want to be connected. I yield my time back. <laughs> Thank you, Aviva, very much. And so next on our panel, we have Dr. Jacqueline J.J. Schinker. Uh, she is a University of Wyoming professor in the Department of Geology and Geophysics. And the past, present, and future of climate and water in the West are topics that drive Dr. Schinker's research and teaching interests. Her research focuses on seasonal climate variability in the Western US, how the atmosphere moves and operates during extreme events, such as droughts, ENSO and early snowmelt events, as well as the impacts, such as extremes, um, the, excuse me, as well as the impacts that such extremes have on water resources, vegetation, fire, and environmental disturbances in the region. Welcome, JJ. Thank you, Christy, and thanks for the invitation for joining you all today, and um, thanks for our participants. I'll pick up um, in terms of talking about El in terms of talking about La Nina, um, as it was mentioned, and and then I'll I'll, I'll kind of circle back around and, and touch on some of the things that were mentioned as it relates to drought, uh, specifically related to snow water equivalents. Um, so here I have on this slide, on the left hand image, uh, the precipitation forecast, a uh, three month seasonal precipitation forecast from NOAA for January, February, and March of this year. Um, this forecast takes into consideration uh, climate trends. It also takes into consideration variability like El Nino, the Southern Oscillation, or ENSO. That's what's at the top of the slide. Um, so ENSO, or El Nino Southern Oscillation, is a mode of variability within the climate uh, ocean atmosphere system that is associated with both El Nino events, neutral events, and La Nina events. We're currently in a La Nina event, um, as Aviva mentioned. And what a La Nina event means for us is not terribly dissimilar from what an El Nino event means for us here in Wyoming. Um, you can see in this precipitation forecast map on the left hand side, the EC or the white ribbon that runs through this map really represents equal chances and EC for NOAA equal chances means there's equal chances of either above normal or below normal or even normal conditions. Um, so that means uh, we're largely dealing with a little bit of a coin toss, but um, we have, have done some recent work in the climate lab here at UW in terms of looking at some of the impacts of strong La Nina events and strong El Nino events in different basins throughout the state of Wyoming. And this is information that's being published this coming year. And some of the information that I'd like to focus on is in this middle graphic here. And what we're showing here are precipitation composite anomalies are looking at strong La Nina years and comparing them to a long-term average. And we've outlined a number of uh, major river basins here in Wyoming. And one take home message for this middle slide is really to focus on the fact that um, during La Nina events, we see a statistically significant relationship between La Nina conditions in the Eastern tropical Pacific and lower than normal precipitation in the North Platte River Basin, especially at the lower elevations. And what's interesting about this work, this is work from Jonathan Priest, one of our recent graduate students. He sliced up our mountain ranges and our river basins to look at high elevation and also look at low elevation to see if there were different responses as it relates to seasonal precipitation. And in fact, he did find some different responses, which leads us to the slide on the right-hand slide looking at 
USDA snow tail data. And this is a nice circle back to Wendy's presentation as she was showing snow tail, uh, current snow water equivalent or SWE percentage of normal. You can see what, you know, the red kind of area that pops out is the lower Platte River Basin and that it is 49% below normal in terms of its snow water equivalent. In fact, a good portion of Wyoming is below normal in terms of the snow water equivalent, which doesn't bode well for the topics that Avila was talking about in terms of fire. It doesn't bode well in terms of talking about topics related to drought, like Tony was mentioning. Um, you see the upper northwest corner um, in terms of the Yellowstone Plateau being oh, very close to percentage of normal precipitation, snow water equivalent. Um, that area is really influenced by precipitation inflow from the Pacific by way of the Columbia River Gorge and the Snake River Plain. So they get a bunch of usually a, a lot more precipitation than most of the rest of the state of Wyoming. So um, I'll leave it there for now. And I welcome questions um, from any of our participants moving forward. Thanks a lot. Thank you, JJ. And our next panelist is Annie Bryce. Uh, Annie is a state program specialist for the USDA Farm Service Agency. Uh, she is based in Casper. Annie assists in the administration of farm bill programs and her primary focus is providing disaster assistance to Wyoming farmers and ranchers. Welcome, Annie. Thank you for having me. Um, I apologize that my video is not working. I have played with it oh. while um, here for a little <laughs> bit and it's a fairly new computer. I can see that the camera, like the slide is open, but clearly there's no picture. Well, um, we, we all, but thank you for having me. That happens. Absolutely. Um, as yeah, you all know, I, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. No, please go ahead. Thank you. As, as you all know, agriculture and the weather, they're very closely tied. Um, and with the 2008 Farm Bill, the USDA Farm Service Agency moved very, um, a lot of their programs moved um, specifically to disaster programs. And with that, they, they wanted a way to tie the programs and, and availability of those programs to some actual data. And so a lot of those programs were tied directly to the National Drought Monitor. In particular, um, the three programs that are listed on this slide, Livestock forage disaster is, is currently active and, and it's a really big one. Back in um, 2015, we had put out a, a, a LFP payment for the, the retroactive years of 2012 and 2013. And we had put out just millions and millions of dollars across the state. This year, we got LFP again and LFP can be triggered by fire, but it also is triggered by drought. Um, it is triggered by the, the National Drought Monitor. So in order to qualify for LFP, you have to be a D2 for eight consecutive weeks, a D3 at any point, uh, a D3 for four consecutive weeks. Uh, okay, so uh, I'm sorry, a D2 for eight consecutive weeks has a payment factor of one. And then it extends um, up until, depending on how deep the drought is, if you're, if you're D4 for four non-consecutive weeks, it would be multiplying that payment times five. But the payment rate for 2020 was 3189. So if you could imagine timesing 31.89 times five times however many cows you have, there's a significant amount of money that goes out in the state for that program. It's comparing feed losses um, and, and um, livestock feed needs. But if, if producers have non-irrigated pasture, which is of course directly affected by the weather um, and, and have eligible cattle, then, then Farm Service Agency is putting out large amounts of money this year and in previous years for livestock forage, which is directly tied to the National Drought Monitor. Another program that we don't always think about is emergency livestock assistance. We had a, a previous emergency program called Emergency Conservation Program that used to do water hauling in drought situations, but it's been absorbed by the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program, ELAP. And with that, you have to be a D3 or a deeper drought in order to qualify for livestock water hauling assistance. So if you have a pasture and your well's gone dry for whatever reason, um, and, and you need to haul some water out to those livestock, we can assist you with those fees. Also honeybee feed losses. It's the only feed loss program under the ELAP that qualifies with drought. But if your honeybees are, have lost their source of, of feed, um, we can assist with purchasing additional feed 
because of a drought. Again, that drought designation under ELAP has to be a D3. And then lastly, the Wildfire Hurricane Indemnity Program, WIP and WIP Plus. It is a um, crop loss program, and it is again tied to that D3 status on the National Drought Monitor. Um, and, and it looks at both quality and quantity losses. Um, there's various things that, that come into play, but it is a crop program. So we have a, a livestock program, um, a water program and a crop program that are all triggered by that national drought monitor. So Tony, we really pay attention to your numbers across the state um, and we appreciate all, all the work that you put into that. And I believe that that is all I have. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Annie. And I'm hoping we'll get to questions here in a few minutes, but before okay. we do, I wanna introduce, yeah, thank you very much. I wanna introduce thank our you. last panelist. And this is Wendy Kelly. Um, she is the University of Wyoming Extension and USDA Northern Plains Climate Hub, Weather Variability and Ag Resiliency Specialist and Regional Extension Program Coordinator, which officially makes her the, the person with the longest title here on the panel. Um, and Wendy, I just wanna make sure you all know, has played a crucial role in bringing this panel together. Um, she has made my job as a moderator quite easy and um, her, her role of bringing people together in this topic um, cannot be um, uh, cannot be overestimated. It's just remarkable what she's done in this space. And so, Wendy, I wonder if you have a few comments before we we turn to questions from the attendees. Great, thank you, Christy, and hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. And if you had a chance to check out my pre-recorded presentation, thanks for doing that. And if you haven't yet, um, some of the information is a little bit out of date now, but I do encourage you to take a peek anyways, just to get an idea of um, what all we do have to offer myself, but also the other panelists and, and who I'm connected with. So as Christy said, I'm a regional extension program coordinator. That's one of my titles and one of the hats I wear. And so it's coordinating and connecting with a lot of experts throughout Wyoming, but also the greater Northern Plains region. So I coordinate efforts throughout a six state area. Um, today, I just wanna highlight two resources. We've talked about the US Drought Monitor um, and, and I know the National Weather Service is always looking for input as well on conditions out on the ground and ways that you as a member of the public can contribute and help us understand what's going out um, on the ground in your area is to contribute to COCO RAWS and that's the first link that you can see on the slide. So the Community Rain, Hill, and Snow Network. It's a citizen science scientist program. And if you caught Tony's introduction earlier, um, you would have heard that he's actually the state coordinator uh, for this program. So it's a volunteer program where you can record precipitation that falls um, at your, for me, it's kind of out in my driveway, uh, near the driveway. I have my Kokoraz rain gauge, which is a standard rain gauge and I monitor and record precipitation or lack of on a daily basis um, or try to on a daily basis. Sometimes I'm not home, so it doesn't happen. Um, and those recordings include the zero. So if I didn't receive any precipitation, it's really important to record that. This information goes into not only Tony, but the National Weather Service can look at it as well as the US Drought Monitor author. So it's really helpful for us to um, see how much precipitation is falling through, you know, on, out on the landscape throughout Wyoming, particularly in such a rural state. The other um, monitoring or observer tool I want to mention or reporting system is the Condition Monitoring Observer Reports. And I mentioned this in my presentation and the hyperlink, um, it's quite long, but it is on the screen right now. And it's referred to as Seymour or some people will call it see more drought, which I try to stay away from because um, I don't want to see more drought. Um, but it's the Seymour system. And this is not only for agriculture, um, but recreation as well as other um, industries or sectors. And this is a, a place where you can go in and you can document and share impacts that you're seeing out on the landscape not just related to drought, but also if conditions are too wet. Um, so it kind of goes from like extreme dry to extreme wet and everything in between. 
And I want to mention this because it's a, a place where you can also upload um, photos for us to understand the conditions in your area. So on the screen, kind of the lower right part of the screen, you can see two pictures here. Um, they're from a restoration project, so a little bit separate, but I wanted to show the value of having comparison photos of a place and not knowing what um, the area looked like before the restoration, we can't appreciate how far it's come since the, the reclamation um, or restoration project took place. And I, I wanted to share these because not only for the Seymour Observer system, but also, you know, emailing um, myself or Tony or others pictures to say like, hey, it's really dry here. Look at this picture. Um, we don't know your pastures or we don't know your um, stock water tanks and what they usually look like. And so having comparison photos of what it looks like in a good year, a normal year or a bad year or a drought year um, is really helpful. And you can upload comparison photos in that Seymour system. So Christy, I'm gonna leave it at that. And, um, and if people have questions about other um, opportunities, I'd be happy to um, share those and, and other tools and resources as well. That's a lot of my job as a coordinator. Great, thank you very much, Wendy. Um, looks like there are a lot of good programs out there. Um, and so now up on the screen, you can see the contact information of all of our panelists. And we'll leave this up for a minute or two right now. And then um, perhaps Jenny, after a minute or two, we can stop sharing screen so that we can see all the panelists' pictures. And uh, perhaps some folks have, have questions. While we're waiting for some questions to come in, I thought I might start with one. Um, I think this is a question for Tony with possibly some follow-up from JJ. Um, and so in Wendy's pre-recorded webinar uh, presentation, she described the de development of drought over the course of the 2020 uh, water year. And there was very rapid change in conditions between May and July. Um, is that kind of rapid change usual uh, or at least common? And I'm wondering if there are trends and how quickly drought comes on um, and maybe there are differences in, in um, how much you can predict what happens at the end of the season based on what happened at the beginning, um, depending on location. Well, there's a term that we use that's sort of analogous to a flash flood and we call it a flash drought. And that's what we experienced this year. And it's also what happened back in 2012 when that drought started that went from 2012 mm -hmm. into 2013. Uh, that one was based upon a really good uh, snowpack year, precipitation year in 2011, which caused the conditions, the grass and everything to really take off. Everything was going great guns on that. And then everything just shut off and things dried out. And that's why we had such a bad fire season as we had all these fuels that started and then, you know, with no moisture, it all dried out and things deteriorated rapidly. Um, you saw, I think, in uh, Wendy's presentation, the drought line, drought timeline that I put together for the state, uh, which goes from January 1st, 2001 through 2000, or 2000 through 2021. That's the period of time mm -hmm. that the, uh, the drought monitor has been in existence and that we can have a, a unified, consistent uh, means of reporting and quantifying drought throughout the state. And at the beginning of that period, you see the long, drought of the 2003, 4, 5, 6 that, that mm -hmm. carried on through there. And then you, you come down to these nice conditions where things are not as bad, uh, things are leveling out. And then like I say in mm -hmm. 2012, you get that spike coming up. And then after a year or so of that, we came back, to, back down until uh, it's the summer, spring, summer of 2020. And I guess all things 2020, if it's going to happen, it was going to happen this year. It, spiked up right again. What we, like I say, we call that that flash drought. So you see that happen fairly, fairly often like that, where you have really no uh, advanced warning. I mean, you get signs of things, but when it hits, it just takes off like, like gangbusters. Yeah, great. Thank you. And JJ, I'm wondering if you have any additional comments on that point. Yeah, thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm glad, Tony, that you mentioned 2012, because it's a really great example of uh, an additional term that I wanna throw in here, and that is the term of variability. 
Um, so, you know, Tony mentioned 2012 and 2012 was the single driest year across the state in Wyoming um, in record history. But 2012 followed 2011, which was the third wettest year in Wyoming. So just, just those two back-to-back -to -back years, I think it was a really important point to make about the notion of variability, um, which is something that we here in Wyoming in our latitude at our particular location, not really near any major water sources or any, any topographic features that deliver moisture from major water sources, that means that we're very much um, at the mercy of the polar jet stream and the, and, the, and the variability that occurs within the polar jet stream. And um, I think what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna share my screen to make one additional point here. And what I'm showing here is a map on the right-hand side um, and, and then a sort of a, a, an analysis of the orange values in that map. What I did was here, we were looking at a bunch of National Climate Data Center uh, climate division data um, that provide precipitation for each month. And we looked at each month's precipitation compared to the annual total. And, and Christy, this gets at the question, you know, in terms of, you know, can one month lead to another month? And, and I think one mm -hmm. thing that's really important for us to understand here with our high variability is that May in this area with orange, May is our month of peak precipitation, but that peak precipitation is really only accounting for on average 15% of our annual total precipitation. So mm -hmm. each month that we're looking at here is contributing a very small percentage, you know, somewhere between 10 and, you know, five and 10% precipitation each month. So in other words, if we have a dry month, that's not good news for us. If we have more than one dry month, that's even worse news for us. So a little mm -hmm. bit of drought in any given month can set the stage for, you know, more of these kind of cascading, uh, you know, abrupt events that Tony was describing. Um, but I just want to, you know, reemphasize this notion that there's a high degree of variability um, within the system in general, regardless of whether we're talking about El Nino or whether we're talking about trends in climate. Okay, wow. Thank you very much for that explanation. Um, if I could throw something in here. Please do. I, uh, just speaking to that variability that JJ was just talking about and Tony talking about that flash drought um, on the larger scale um, in the incident meteorologist program. Uh, we went from our 10th slowest year deploying out to wildfires at the beginning of fire season to our fourth busiest year um, starting really in September when we had 37 incident meteorologists out at one time, which hit some records for us. Um, so there, it was a very large swing and <laughs> um, that it just hits on that variability. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question now from an attendee. Um, Wendy, this is for you and you've seen the question. Um, and I'm wondering how much credence is given to a report such as you have in your presentation in which the person hasn't been in place for five years and has never seen a condition such as they are now. I'm wondering if, um, I think I would need to follow up a little bit with this attendee to find out a little bit more about, about what they're wanting to, to ask you about. I'm wondering if, um, if I should do that or if you have a, uh, an, an idea of an answer. Yeah, thank you, Christy. And I, I do see the question. And so I think um, you know, the question is in my presentation, I shared about the condition, the Seymour system, the observer system, and where individuals can submit an observation from the ground and impacts. And one of the questions that the Seymour system asks is how long an individual, the reporting individual, has lived in that area um, or has visited because sometimes somebody goes somewhere, you know, every Thanksgiving I spend it in X place. And so I know that area. Um, and so the, the report example that is in the presentation, the pre-recorded presentation, 
um, the individual indicated that they were there uh, for five years or so. And the question is how much weight or value is um, given to that report based on an individual only being in an area for five years or so. Mm-hmm. And to answer your question in terms of, you know, when we look at these um, reports that are submitted, one that's for me, because I, I'm out in Western Wyoming, and so when I saw that report come in, um, it was the first one of the season, it was like, oh, wow, hold on, what's going on out in Eastern Wyoming? Because I, I wasn't um, in tune. So for myself, it kind of raises the flag of like, I need to probably start putting my personal feelers out and asking mm-hmm. questions. And I was already, I watched the US Drought Monitor weekly. Um, and so for myself, like taking a closer look and really thinking more critically um, about it. and. So I personally use it as a way to, um, that flag is starting to be raised or draw my attention. Now, in terms of how Tony uses it, he might use it, I'll give Tony an opportunity to kind of talk about how he uses it. But I I will say in terms of the US Drought Monitor authors, um, I think it's really similar. It kind of raises the flag for them to say, okay, what's going on out there? Whether if it's dry or wet, um, whatever the impacts might be. But when the drought monitor authors are writing the drought monitor on a week to week basis, they look for a convergence of evidence. So there might be a report in the Seymour system about impacts out on the ground, but they're also looking at the drought monitor authors are also looking at a lot of um, quantitative data and looking at the full story and there needs to be a convergence of evidence. So in terms of how it's weighted, I can't speak exactly um, from their perspective, but I do know that they're looking at a lot of data to inform their decision on, on the final um, drought monitor map. And, and Tony might have more to add for how he uses those observations in the recommendations that he makes on behalf of Wyoming. Great, thank you. Tony, did you have any follow-up? Yeah, and it's quite a bit of that is similar to what Wendy was saying there. When I see a, a single point like that, that becomes sort of the the heads up really and that sort of directs attention to a particular area and as as Wendy alluded to then start gathering more information there I mean especially when it's a you know only a five-year history I mean five years you go back five years from now yeah you're not even to the 2012 drought so uh, where it sits in that is kind of kind of ambiguous just from that report so then we start looking at other conditions and taking a, a closer look at the data that are being presented there and then, as, as Wendy also said, it's not just one parameter that's looked at when you're, you're considering a decision to make as far as a, a drought category either going up or down in an area. You look at a multitude of, of indices. And if you get one report that's just not really jiving with all the other things that are coming in, maybe you, you wait a week or you wait two weeks and see if additional reports come in that give justification for that and, and move forward from there. But a single report by itself in a, in a vacuum, there's not a lot you can do with it when it's when you're looking at only a five year period. I mean, doing the math on that, that would take it to the 20th percentile at best, which is you're going to be looking at D1 at, at, at most. So, yeah, it's it's a it's a heads up. It gets your it directs your attention to look at additional things around there and and see what the the other data are showing and whether or not that's supported. And as she also said, contact people in the area that you know to see if, you know, who haven't reported to see if you're getting, uh, you know, corroboration with that and, and move from there. Thanks so, bu- so much to both of you for answering a question that I didn't quite understand. And now I understand both the question and the answer for which I am grateful. Thank you. Um, I had another question for you, um, and this Wendy's presentation made me think about this over and over again, and that's what is exactly the difference between weather and climate, right? I mean, um, so climate is what you expect and weather is what you get, um, and I, I guess it must have something to do with the quality of the forecasting, perhaps, and I'm wondering, um, I think Aviva and JJ, you might, might both have thoughts on this, and you're both laughing at, at, <laughs> at what I've said so far. Which, oh, which no, one not of you laughing. Like to... just, I just love questions like that. But I'm going to defer yeah. to Aviva because she's our, uh, uh, she, she's our public representative for the National Weather Service. <laughs> I was 
going to let you describe climate, but so weather is what's happening now and in the future. Climate, at least climatology, is what has happened in the past, what are the patterns, but looking ahead, you can use climatology to forecast the big picture. So mm. when I'm looking ahead and um, putting together a forecast for a fire partner, for example, I'm looking at things like Enso, La Nina. I started briefing out to my fire weather partners that we were probably going into an, a period of extended fire conditions back in March because I saw La Nina with its red flag going. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's the difference. It's really climate kind of dictates the overall big pattern, but within that big pattern, you can have breaks. And that's the weather, that's the day-to-day -day weather. Um, so it's the now and into the future. Yeah, and I, I, yeah, exactly. I would, and, and the only mm -hmm. thing I would add to that is um, when I think about climate and, and climatology, I'm typically thinking about how those are average conditions, whether they're average conditions over time, average conditions over seasons, or over episodes like droughts or El Nino or La Nina events. Um, so I think of climate as being average of weather. Or, or the average of what we see as the representation of meteorology. Exactly, yep. One analogy I sometimes give on mm -hmm. that is you have, using baseball is you have your batting average, you have a player's batting average is climate, what he hits a particular day is weather. Very true. Got it. Mm -hmm. That makes good sense. And before we switch gears, then I wanted to ask uh, a follow up question to that. Um, so uh, the snow water equivalent is equivalency is below normal for most of the state right now. Um, and I guess I'm I'm wondering, um, you know, given that that so much of of Wyoming uh, depends on spring snow belt for irrigation and river water in the summer. I mean, is there a general rule of thumb uh, for a month or a time period in the spring um, or late winter when you can know with some sense of certainty what kind of a, a water year it's going to be in the summer? Who wants to take that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, I can speak generally, um, or JJ yeah. can take lead on that. Okay, um, so at least in the National Weather Service, we know that the big snowstorms that we get generally happen in March and April. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, if people can remember the blizzard of 2019 followed by, uh, uh, in March, followed by another mm -hmm. one in April, <laughs> Um, um, those are the big months that could really turn things around. I'll let Tony and Wendy talk to that if they want to. Um, but that if we continue to be dry through those months, then my, my real concern will be kicking in for fire season and drought. Yeah, Aviva, I would agree with that. And, and what's interesting about that, and, and Tony, you can certainly add on to this as well is, um, you know, um, March, um, March, April, May, that, that springtime, May being the peak amount of precipitation, as I mentioned earlier, but only by a little bit. But that's also typically when we get our wet, wetter, heavier snows than we do during other times of our snowfall seasons. You know, 2011, that third wettest year for Wyoming that preceded the driest year for Wyoming, 2011 actually was unremarkable until May. And it dumped in May and it brought our snow water equivalent like boom up really, really fast. So I think, you know, in some parts, especially in high elevations, um, you know, in those high elevation mountain watersheds, um, those are the areas that are um, very important to receive that heavy um, event, those heavy events that Aviva is talking to. But I'll just add one additional thing in there and that's, um, challenges that we're facing back to Tony's conversation about the flash drought. One of the things that we are seeing is that because temperatures are increasing the fastest in the spring months in March, April, May, um, that means that snow is melting, whatever snow is there on the landscape melts even quicker off of the landscape, which leaves less water later in the growing season, um, later in the summer in July and August. So there are multiple things working in addition to the variability of precipitation. There are also trends in temperature that we're dealing with 
um, from a water resource perspective as well. This is Annie. Um, I, I had to laugh a little bit. I used to attend regularly um, interagency meetings with Chris Jones over at the Riverton Weather Station. And we, his joke always was that he would say equal chances. So then he's never wrong with the weather. So equal chances that it could be terrible. But that being said, Tony, you know, you had, you had made, you made the result, had said that this year was a flash flood similar to 2012. In 2012, really that drought continued on through 2013. And so, so when you, when you say flash flood or, or flash drought, um, we could be looking at a multi-year event. And Annie, I'm, I'm glad you spoke up because the next question I think is for you. Um, so this is from, um, from one of the attendees. Um, the D0, D1, D2, et cetera levels were mentioned for the FSA programs. Um, so for our listeners who did not see Wendy's pre-recorded uh, presentation, I'm wondering if you could remind us what those, what those, um, those drought levels indicate. Well, Tony actually is um, determines those drought levels, but as far as FSA programs and availability, um, we watch that National Drought Monitor, which is updated weekly, and 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 two of the three programs that I mentioned, um, the WIP and the WIP Plus and and the ELAP, they both need a, a D three determination, whereas the LFP can trigger after eight consecutive weeks at a D two. Is that what was that your question? Um, not sure yes, thank you. Yeah, and I'm wondering if Tony, could you um, follow up with a little bit of a, you know, what is the difference between D0, D1, and D2? Yeah, I can get into a little description of what those are. There's there's the the four rankings of actual drought and then the precursor to drought, which is considered the D0 or abnormally dry. And they go from a D0, obviously, to D1, D2, D3, and D4. And those are uh, moderate, severe, extreme, and exceptional droughts. And those are all based on various levels that you see in these indices. Uh, I mentioned the percentiles earlier when, uh, when we opened this up. The, the D0 is if you have your indices in a uh, generally 20 to 30 uh, percentile. Uh, going to D1, you'd be in the 11, you know, 10, 11 to the 20th percentile. D2 is in generally from the 5 to 10. And then two to five is, so I mean, if you're down there in the, the two to five percentile, then you're looking at D3. And then if you're looking at D4, the exceptional drought, you're looking at zero to two. So 2% you know, of the time you're seeing, or 2% or less of the time you're seeing conditions uh, equivalent to what you'd be seeing in an exceptional drought. And that's on the percentile basis. The other indices have different uh, cutoffs that are similar to that, but it, it's really based on that that ranking of the percentile within terms of what your, your generally observed values are for, for a given parameter. Got it, thank you, Tony. And then to follow up a bit more, Annie, I'm wondering um, to, to qualify for uh, the Livestock Forage Program, for example, do you need to be an existing client uh, with FSA or what is the timing on that? And, and um, how, how is it that producers, you know, figure out that, that they do qualify? That's, um, that's based a great, on, yeah. That's yeah, a great question. Um, if you normally don't participate with FSA, I would obviously encourage you to go in and, and put your name and address and contact information into the system so that we can at least get information out to you when it does become available. Mm -hmm. So in 2020, the national office um, didn't differentiate um, county by county, what our grazing seasons were for Wyoming. Um, and in the system, the livestock forage system, it can't differentiate between growing and grazing season. Uh, before a lot of our programs were tied around that grazing season and, and we had the grazing set, season set similar to the growing season, which, you know, obviously we have a lot of pastures that are, are grazed outside of the growing season. In which case we had adjusted numerous states um, Albany, Bighorn, Carbon, Fremont, Hot Springs, Lincoln, Natrona, Park, Sublette, Sweetwater, Uinta, and Washakie, all the 365 day grazing period, which then made a lot of these programs available 365 days a year. 
Those other counties that I didn't mention, Campbell, Converse, Natrona, Platte, Crook, Johnson, Laramie, Sheridan, and Weston, all of their grazing seasons are tied directly to their growing season. So normally LFP, it needs to be triggered within your grazing season. So the whole state was defaulted by the national office in 2020 to 365 days, which means that Weston and Crook, for example, who come November and December, um, spent eight consecutive weeks at a D2 triggered LFP in, in November and December. Um, all the other counties in Wyoming, aside from Park and, and Teton had triggered earlier in the year. But typically in a year where those flags are set correctly by the national office, the only counties that are gonna be triggering LFP all year long are those counties that I first spoke about. Um, in, in which case the drought monitor, it, it could trigger at any time. If, if they have eight consecutive weeks and they hit that in December of 2020, for example, like um, I believe it was Crook that hit it in, in December, um, although it could have been Weston. Um, anyways, they'll trigger that and they'll be eligible for one month of payment in December. Mm -hmm. Otherwise you do have to trigger, you have to hit those eight consecutive weeks or you have to hit D3 at some point or you have to hit D4 at some point within that, that growing season. Um, and if you do, as soon as you do, then that program becomes available. LFP has a deadline of 30 days after the calendar year. So this year, January 30th falls on a weekend. So LFP for 2020, the deadline to apply for that program is February 1st. Now with ELAP, the Emergency Livestock Assistance Program, when we talked about um, it, primarily for, for drought and purposes anyways, is the water hauling and the additional feed costs for bees. Um, those programs become available as soon as that county, any portion of that county, so it could be the very little corner with 20 acres hits D3, then that whole entire county becomes eligible for that program. So, so with ELAP, you need to notify the county office of a loss within 30 days of loss being apparent. So, so really, um, you know, you could come in and notify the office that you're hauling water, even though they're not D3 yet. In the event that they do turn D3, then, then you've notified the office that you had a loss and that you're hauling water and you would become eligible for those benefits. Um, similar to LFP, all the information needs to, meaning the application for payment and the supporting documentation needs to be turned in 30 days after the calendar year. But those, that notice of loss is a little more critical on ELAP and it does need to be, we do need to, put, we do need to be notified within 30 days of loss being apparent. Um, WIP, the WIP program that, that is a crop disaster program, it, it comes and it goes. And so uh, again, I would, I would recommend anybody who has any interest in, in um, disaster, agriculture disaster programs to, to get into contact with their local FSA office in order to get on a contact list so they can get the newsletter, et cetera. When these programs become available, obviously we do put out information saying that they are available. WIP is not something that's available all the time. It would be obviously triggered by an event. We did have it in 2020. If this flash drought is anything like the 2012, you know, there's obviously a lot of potential to have these programs in 2021 as well. Thank you, Annie. Um, there's a lot of useful information there, and I'm sure that folks can contact you uh, with the information, um, your contact information uh, for additional information. That'd be great. I have, I think we're running short on time now, and I, I hope we have time for just one or more, uh, one or two more questions. Wendy, I wanted to ask you, um, so in your job, you coordinate weather or climate drought information from a lot of different sources. And I'm wondering if there's one type of program or, or information or a tool um, that you think is underutilized that you wish that, um, that producers uh, were able to access more easily or um, it would really help them out and you'd like to see more producers utilize. Thanks, Christy. So I, I do have the opportunity to learn about a lot of different um, tools and resources that are out there. Um, I will say that one of my um, favorite kind of one-stop shops 
is uh, the Western Water Assessment, which is a, a group of NOAA, um, so Western Water Assessment. They have a dashboard that I use, and, and Tony has a similar one that I also use um, that is, is really handy, and I apologize. I'm trying to navigate uh, to share my screen so I can show this and pull it up. Um, so it's a nice spot where you can go and um, stay up to date on current resources without having to track a bunch of websites. I'm sharing my screen now. This is the, the Western Water Assessment. Again, it's a, a part of NOAA. Um, and you can scroll down and you can see some of the information for recent temperatures and precipitation um, and click on it, zoom in. Um, there's also uh, different drought indices, the SWE, the, the snow water equivalent map that JJ had um, on her presentation. So this is a nice just kind of one place um, to go as, as well as Tony's website and the National Weather Service. Um, but I wanted to mention WWA since they're not on today. Mm. A tool, I, another tool I wanna share um, just real briefly that some folks may not be aware of yet. It's called the Grassland Produc Production Forecast or Grass Cast. It's relatively new. Um, so this coming growing season will be its third season of forecasting um, production for areas of Wyoming. You'll see um, on this website that doesn't forecast for all counties of Wyoming um, for various reasons based on the data sets and everything. But you can, they start releasing the forecasts around the beginning of May to help producers make more informed decisions. And what it is, is a set of three maps um, and suggesting based on the amount of precipitation we've seen so far in the um, water year and what the forecast, so for example, the forecast that JJ had and or the outlook in her um, presentation on the left-hand side with the equal chances and she talked about, it takes into consideration all of that and um, gives an idea of how much uh, production in an area or a county might see based off a of percent um, historically. So it's a great tool. Um, I'm not explaining it super well, but there's a lot of great information on their website, which is grasscast.unl.edu. Um, and you can look at zoomable maps. So you can zoom into your county or your area more and get a, a, get a feel for what the production might be. That looks great, Wendy. Both of those look like really uh, useful resources and user-friendly as well. Um, thank you for that. And we have um, time for one more question. I think this is from Kathy who asks, oh, this is a big question. We need more than two minutes. Um, have you seen changes in the frequency of drought over the years? Are we experiencing drought any more frequently now than we did in the past? Would any of you like to, yeah, JJ, please. Yeah, I, I can totally, I, I actually saw Kathy's questions. I got all excited and I found oh. an image that I wanna show. Uh, this is okay. just for Wyoming Climate Division 10, which is the upper plat. And, and this is from 1979 to 2014, um, but it shows, you know, somewhat recent droughts. Um, you know, we can certainly extend this back from a paleoclimate perspective and see droughts that may have been more longer lasting than any of the ones that are being shown on this time series. Um, but the resolution is not annual when we're looking at long-term drought outside of, say, annual tree ring records. Um, so my short answer to Kathy is not necessarily, the frequency, it may, it may not necessarily be changing, um, but one thing I'll point out here, while we're looking at 40 years worth of data, um, and it's not enough to say uh, from a statistically significant perspective, um, changes in temperature may be actually leading to deeper droughts, which is what we see towards the end portion in the 2000s um, in, in terms of this record. So not we don't see so much in terms of changes in the frequency of drought. And I'll emphasize my a, a long term soapbox issue of uh, I don't talk about droughts on cycles because droughts are not part of cycles. Um, when we talk about cycles, we talk about the seasonal cycle, like it's going to get warm in spring and um, in summertime. That's a that's a cycle. Mm. But because we see changes in temperature, that may be 
sort of amplifying some of the things that Tony has talked about in terms of um, you know, the flash droughts um, with drying in early spring that we are seeing in across Wyoming and, and across much of the West. I made it within less than two minutes, Christy. Very impressive. Um, <laughs> would any of our other panelists like to add um, to what JJ has so eloquently explained? Okay, well, thank you all for um, wonderful question and answer exchange. We're almost at the end of our time. So I wanna thank all of the attendees for coming. Um, you will be asked to fill out a short evaluation survey as you leave the webinar. And we, we really do appreciate your feedback. Um, we'll use it to improve future offerings like this. So please do fill out the survey. We appreciate that. Um, and especially thank you to our panelists for uh, this informative hour. I have certainly learned a lot and I hope that all the rest of you have as well. Um, please remember that uh, contact information is available for all panelists in the agenda um, for, for this convention. And also please remember to catch uh, remaining live sessions that we have as part of the convention. There's one at 6 p.m. tonight, general Q&A sections, sessions for the pre-recorded videos. And then tomorrow at noon, we have our second and final roundtable discussion session being held on Colorado River Basin water issues. Thank you again for joining us today and have a good rest of the afternoon. Thanks.